views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. Hi guys, I'm M, also known as The Hungry Dominican, and I'm your host for Foodie Down Bronx. Welcome! This is the show where we catch up with artists, entrepreneurs, chefs, and foodies who make a part of the incredible and ever-growing Bronx food scene. So if you like to eat, get your appetites ready, and stay tuned. From Bronx and to the world, you know what this is, Foodie Down Bronx. Foodie Down Bronx. Stay connected to us on Instagram at BronxNet TV, at Foodie Down Bronx, and make sure to follow me at The Hungry Dominican. On today's show, we'll talk to multimedia journalist Nadia Cruz and Bronx blogger Gotham Foodie. We'll get a chance to discuss personal motivations, goals, social media, and of course, food. But before we meet our guests, let's get into this week's Chew News. <laughs> McDonald's and Beyond Meat have partnered up to create the PLT, which stands for Plant-Based Lettuce and Tomatoes. The new meatless burger is available at several locations in Canada and will be tested out at those locations for the next 12 weeks before possibly making its way to the States. This is not the first vegetarian burger McDonald's has put out, having introduced the, be the Big Vegan TS Burger in Germany earlier this year. With Burger King experiencing brisk sales of the Impossible Whopper, the move on McDonald's part was sort of inevitable. DoorDash has recently announced that way back in May, the company experienced a data breach that could have affected 4.9 million customers. As a result, the breach, the last digits from the affected consumers' cards, their names, email addresses, phone numbers, and more were all leaked. Point of the story is this, guys. Use your phone, call up your neighborhood Chinese spot, tell them it's a pickup, you're all good. And that's it for this week's two news. We're taking a quick break. Foodie Down Bronx, we'll be right back. Music is a bridge between the material and the spiritual. As a blind person, you have to be aware that nobody can tell you what you can or can't do. You really have to try things. My wife, who was also blind, was a good cook. When she died, that's when I started Meals on Wheels. My name is Harvey Lauer. America, let's do lunch. Drop off a hot meal and say hello. Volunteer by donating your lunch break at americaletsdolunch.org. Hmm, maybe you can make retirement happen. After all, you made this vacation happen. Double points with every purchase. Cleverly merging promotions. I love it. Cross-referencing travel sites. And booking all your flights with those... Vouchers, I got us bumped. They were like, oh, but now they're like... <laughs> Aloha. You aced this vacation. Now get the tips you need to get on track at aceyourretirement.org. Patriotism. It inspires passionate debate. It's worn like a badge of honor with good reason. Because it means love and devotion for one's country. But what really makes up this country of ours? It's the people. To love America is to love all Americans. This year, patriotism shouldn't just be about pride of country. It should be about love. Love beyond age, sexuality, 
disability, race, religion, and other labels. Because love has no labels. 150 over 90. 180 over 111. 160 over 110. I had a stroke. This is what high blood pressure looks like. You might not feel its symptoms, but the results from a stroke are far from invisible or silent. If you've come off your treatment plan, get back on it or talk with your doctor to create an exercise, diet, and medication plan that works for you. Go to loweryourhbp.org. If I would have followed a treatment plan, I would not be in this situation. to Foodie Down Bronx. Sancocho is a traditional soup in many Latin American households, and over the weekend, I was pleased to enjoy some at the Big Bronx Sancochazo, a community event by Green Workers Cooperative. Let's check it out on this edition of Boogie Down Eats. <laughs> everyone, on this edition of Boogie Down Eats, we're at Brook Park in the South Bronx for the Big Bronx Sancochazo, a potluck festival. Today we'll be learning about climate change and how it impacts us all, as well as contributing, making and enjoying some traditional Latin American soup, aka Sancocho, right here in the community. Let's check it out. with Omar from Green Workers Cooperative. Omar, thank you so much for taking um, some time to talk to me. I know it's super busy. You can feel the energy, it's pumping right now, it's super live. Um, I wanted to ask you about exactly what's going on because when I first walked in, the energy was real, it was palpable, I loved it, it's very community-based. So tell me a little bit more about the big Sanco Chasso. Sure, so this is an event we have every year. This is our sixth year doing it. And uh, this is the Big Bronx Sanco Chasso. It's basically a potluck festival where we have people come and bring something to contribute to making a giant sancocho, enough for about 200 people. People uh, come and bring the, the yuca, the yautia, the platanos, the meats, all the things that go into the sancocho. And we have a vegan and a meat sancocho, so we got something for everybody. And this is our way of really having a festival where people, anybody who walks in, can really experience what the power is of cooperation. When people come together, work together, and create something out of what you think is nothing. We don't know if this is true or not, but we believe that we make the biggest sancocho in New York City. So it's all happening right here. Let's just claim that you do, right? We Let's just say that you do. do. This is the biggest sancocho in New York City. In New York ever. So you said that this is the sixth year that you've been doing this. Has it been in the same location or have you done different locations in the Bronx? It's always been in this location. So the home of the Sancocho, and this is, my son is over here trying to get my attention and get on the mic. What's up, big man? Hi. So this happens every year. We've always been doing it here in Brook Park. Um, we're gonna keep doing it in Brook Park until we're bursting out into the street. We love Brook Park. This is a community institution and it really personifies what the Sancochazo is about. This was formed, you know, back in the, in the, you know, about 30 plus years ago. People came together and just broke up the street, the, the broken, the rubble strewn lot that was here and turned this into a park, into a community garden. So there's planting, there's chicken coops, 
There are community activities here. There's alternatives to incarceration work that happens here. And it's all people who came together to actually uh, turn, take a piece of, of what had been abandoned and reclaim it for the community. And that's what we're doing here in the San Cochazo. We actually help people to launch worker-owned businesses, worker cooperatives. And so when we decided to do the San Cochazo, it was really to say, what can we do that shows people what cooperation looks like? Because when people are starting cooperatives, it's a completely different mindset, a different culture shift. It's about working together. You're not working for somebody else. You're not you know, waiting to be told what to do. And you're not just telling people what to do. You're working together in cooperation. So you know, this is a way for people to see what cooperation looks like and how powerful it can be. What do you think is the most important ingredient in a Sancocho? <laughs> well, I'm a vegetarian. So I think I kind of know your, <laughs> I know your answer already, okay. So, you know, I go for the platano. Excellent answer. Oh, my, my man. We're here with Isanet Batista from Woke Foods. Isanet, hola. Hola. Um, so we have three large pots going on right here. Could you tell me what exactly we have in these pots? Sure. So we have two vegan sancochos, and in the middle we have the more traditional meat-based sancocho being made by my grandmother. So I wanted to ask you, um, when it comes to sancochos, there's a lot of elements that have to go into them. Um, you have your corn, you have your plantains, you have your poultry. Um, your yuca, mm -hmm. uh, what do you consider the most integral part of a sancocho, the thing that you have to have in order to make a successful sancocho? I definitely say the root vegetables, so I'd say like chaltia, platano, yuca, because those are the ones that disintegrate and are going to give sancocho that thickness that it's known to have. So people are usually very surprised when they have vegan sancocho, like it tastes just the same because it has all the root vegetables that a meat-based sancocho has. So while it doesn't have maybe that meaty taste, it's still going to have that root vegetable taste, regardless of whether you put meat in it or you do. This will be my first time uh, tasting a vegan sancocho, so I'm really excited oh about yeah. that. Yeah, I've never had one. I've only ever had the sort of like, I guess the more classical one, or the mm -hmm. one that people really are familiar with. How long does a traditional sancocho uh, take to make? So this one, um, aleña, or like with fire, um, it's going to take about four hours, four or five hours. But if you make it at home in a stovetop, maybe like three hours. It's definitely a long process because you're having to peel a lot of the vivides, which are, you know, take a minute because the vivides, the skin is really thick. If you make it with meat, you have to clean the meat and season it the day before. Um, so, you know, it's a process. It's, a, it's like a really great thing on a rainy day or for someone's birthday. Those are my memories. Either it was raining or it was someone's birthday. This is one of the platos of Santo Domingo, the Salcocho. Because todo el mundo, usted tiene una actividad en su casa y usted le dice para compartir. Vamos a hacer un Sancocho. Vamos a hacer un cumpleaños. Ah, pero que vamos a hacer un Sancocho. Más que otro plato. Por lo regular, ese es el plato típico. Típico de decir para actividades nuestra el salcocho. Guys, I'm here with Chef Gabby. Making a sancocho has a lot of moving parts, so there's a lot of things going on right here. So what exactly have you been in charge of today? Um, I've been in charge of doing a lot of the prep work. Um, all of the vegetables, our sofritos, some of the side dishes like the potato salad. And basically what a sancocho and what you know, it means is that everybody kind of can play a part. And in family, as you're growing up, everybody has a role. You know, you peel the corn, someone peels the, the yuca, and there's somebody cutting, there's someone washing. So it really brings everybody together. So it's a great concept. Hey guys, what's up? Hey. Can you scoot you over a bit? I want yeah, to see what you guys are up to. So, yeah, so this is a potluck event, right? So uh, have they officially made you in charge of sofrito? No, I just nominated myself and brought brought some of my own ingredients in here. Oh, nice. Okay. I'm sitting down and I'm making sofrito, like a classic Puerto Rican. And, uh, what exactly are you uh, bringing to this event, sir? Uh, I actually, when I came here, I brought in some bags of basil, some Italian peppers, some serrano peppers uh, to be used in the sancocho san if needed.
Uh, it's going to be really hard parting with all of this delicious food, but I suppose sharing is caring. So, and back to you in the studio. You're missing out, bro. This is really good. Uh, all right, guys. So, great segment for um, on-site M, but I have to say he's a bit of a bit of arrogance right there, telling me that I missed out. I was there. I'm the guy. Anyway, guys, we'll be right back after this commercial break. I think what makes Havana Cafe special or different is just our overall environment. It's not just a restaurant. 80% of our guests are return customers, which is wonderful for us. It's become a neighborhood, a neighborhood gem. This is a restaurant that serves uh, predominantly Cuban dishes. We have a really well-rounded menu. We have vegetarian, we have vegan options. We also have great sandwiches. Regardless of what you're looking for, we have traditional Latin food, we have traditional Cuban food. But we also have lighter fare, we have a very well-rounded menu, and there's something for everybody. So we have mojitos, uh, we, we, you know, our bartenders are first class. Our mojitos are hand muddled, every single one. What people should expect when they come here is that they encounter a family-friendly environment. I think most of all what I want people to experience and walk away with is a feeling that they walked in somewhere where they were made to feel like they were at home. The overall ambiance, the overall feel of family and community and, and, and comfort and friendliness that they encounter when they come here, it's genuine. And I think people, they, they sense that. To me, Latin cuisine is really an emotion. It has a lot to do, um, obviously, with good ingredients, but it's about the passion that you put into the food that you do. And that's what we want people to feel when they come here. Hi, I'm Peter, and there's nothing I love more than sharing vegetables with my friends. Come on in! Help yourself to anything. That's why we give our food the utmost respect it deserves. Did you know there are simple steps we can all take to help save food? You can cook it, store it, even share it. Just don't waste it. Because when it comes to food, better ate than never. To learn more, visit savethefood.com. Welcome back to Foodie Down Bronx. I'm your host, M, the Hungry Dominican. Our first guest is Nadia Cruz, a charismatic, charming multimedia journalist who goes by the name Feature Sauce on Instagram, where she highlights restaurants around New York City, including right here in the BX. Welcome to the show, Miss Cruz. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much. You. So you and I met at the, the panel that I had with the same title, Foodie Down Bronx. That was back in April. Yes. And soon after that, I looked up your social media page and I realized that you, at this point, are pretty much a seasoned veteran of being in front of the, the TV. Yes. Um, so can you tell me a little bit about Featured Sauce? Uh, tell me about your career in journalism because I feel like when I see your social page, I love everything that I see and there's definitely like a party 
energy, positive vibe to it. Um, so yeah, tell me about yourself and tell me about uh, your career. There's so many different things. So I went to school for broadcast journalism mm -hmm. and I thought that I wanted to do hard news, come to find out it's not really for me. Like you said, I'm a lot more bubbly and mm -hmm. more energetic and I love to just be in the kind of, like you said, like a party type yeah. of vibe. Not party, more loungy. Mm -hmm. um, so I interned at NBC at uh, New York Live, which I'm trying to make my way back. And I did a, like a lot of field production. And a lot of the field production was at restaurants. And I was like, oh my God, this is what I want. Like, why didn't I think of this is exactly what I want to do? Like yeah. I was posting about a lot of food. Like I love to take pictures of food and I'm still in the process of learning about a lot of food, but I've been in love with it ever since. And I'm like, no, this is exactly what I want to do. I want to be developing stories over food. I either want to be sharing the stories of the chefs, the people cooking it, um, the people that are coming to eat it, or I want to be getting somebody's story over their favorite dish. Right. And perhaps, you know, you can help me cook it or you can take me to your favorite restaurant and just have a great conversation that's inspiring and educative to those people that are watching. Mm. So it's, 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 um, it's somewhat similar to, to what I wanted to do with this show and I think that's why I, I responded so well to your page and because I could see it, the initiative was there, the initiative of putting out these people's stories, getting more of the behind the scenes feel, not so much, I mean yes, you do talk about food of course, but yeah. you, it's really about the person behind the food. Um, which I find super admirable because um, uh, prior to, to the taping of this episode, I was interviewed um, on another show here, and I had said as much. I was like, you know, food is wonderful. You know, cooking segments are fun. That's all good. Um, but hearing about someone's journey and their passion for food is really something that moves me. And um, so I love the fact that you sort of, you know, put that out there on your, on your page. So going through your your journalism, and, and that's when you, again, like you said, you realize, oh, food is where I have to be at. Yes. This is where I really want to push yes. myself. And I mean, more. that's a short story. I've also served. Mm -hmm. So I've been a server for five years okay. at a restaurant. I took that job because I needed to find a way to be able to leave my full-time job, to go back to school. I have a psych minor, mm -hmm. and I wanted to go back to be on camera. And it was the only job that would allow me to do that. And at first, it was like, well, how am I going to do that? How, how am I going to carry this tray here? Because we mm. have to carry them here. And I was so nervous about it. But I wanted to learn so badly right. that, like, within three months, I was great. Because I was great at service. Mm. I, liked, I like serving. Mm. So everything that has to do with food, I love. It's not only just that's like, I want to make food for you, too, which I do. Right. And I share these recipes. And I want you to come over. And I want to give it to you. Because when you tell me that the food that I made made you happy, I'm happy. Right. Well, I mean, food is such a personal thing. Yeah. So I like every right. aspect of food, like right. where you serve it, who's cooking it, how we made it, where did it come from, what inspired you, everything. Uh, you mentioned uh, b before we got on air, you mentioned Danny Myers. You were, you were yes. reading his book, Setting the Table. Yes. Is that the, the book? Yes. Um, and that talks about the restaurant industry. Yes. Specifically about service. Yes. Um, so, if you go to a restaurant and you have the best service you've experienced, but the food is not the best, how do you sort of justify uh, recommending that place to somebody? Or do those two things, needless to say, have to be on the same level? Or how do you justify that type of experience? So, for me, they do have to be on the, the same level for the most part. Mm. But if the service was superb, spectacular, this person made me feel good, mm -hmm. I'm going to recommend it. Mm -hmm. Because I think you need this place for your soul. Mm -hmm. And I think eventually we can have a conversation with the restaurant, like, your food is okay, your right. service is amazing, and right. if we could probably bring your food up to the service level, then you're going to be killing it. You're right. going to be, because you're doing an amazing thing. I love coming here. Mm -hmm. So I would recommend it, but I would, I would say that. I said the service is a lot better, the food is okay, but you're going to love going there. Are there any, uh Restaurants that you wouldn't mind putting on blast that maybe that's exactly what happened? I'd rather not. Okay. <laughs> All right. Fair enough. <laughs> fair enough. Um, I, I, I always wonder if I should ask people, like, do you feel comfortable telling me about a place that, again, maybe the, the food was either, you know, things don't match up. The service was great or the service wasn't great, but the food maybe just didn't match up to the service or vice versa. But I hear you, though. I totally understand. Um, so I've seen on your page that you have actually been to the Bronx. You, you've put some spots up here. 
Um, is there a specific type of food that you focus on? Is it more Latin American? Is it more, or is it just a, you know, a mix of things? Because um, I love the fact that you've been in the Bronx period, because I always tell people the same thing. I feel like I'm always on repeat. I don't see enough representation of food in the Bronx. And so when I see a blogger using a platform like Instagram or Facebook or whatever, and doing that, that to me, it's like, you're awesome. Because it's so underrepresented on social. So for you, is like, is there something specific, or you just basically go to any borough you want or any spot that you think is just well worth, you know, putting up there? So right now, yes, uh, I think the mission was with featured sauce was to be developing more stories with people of color. Mm -hmm. It's it doesn't necessarily always happen that way, and mm -hmm. I want people that aren't us to understand our stories through these food conversations. Right. That was the mission, but. It happens that if I'm at a good restaurant, I think that you need to hear about it. I'm going to let you know. Like You right. need to come here. Right. And to your other question, um, I love ajo y oregano here in the Bronx. I'm from the hood. I'm from Patterson. Yeah. So for me, Patterson, Bronx, it's very similar. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to go back to my roots. I would always say I I'm not going to leave my house to have Dominican food. But if you go to ajo y oregano, you're going to know why. Right. Like It feels like you're at home. The service is amazing. It's a mm -hmm. family-owned business. They've never owned a restaurant. They've never run a business. Nobody's in the kitchen has ever worked at a restaurant. And it's admirable. Yeah. The service, like, the, the colors. It's like, because we come from humble beginnings, but we make it colorful. Mm -hmm. We make it pretty. We make it clean. We make it nice. Mm -hmm. And I think that Ajo Oregano in the Bronx is, like, such a great representation of who I am. Right. So I love it. I'm going to recommend it. And I am going to leave my house to have that Dominican food. To go there. Yes. Yeah, that was uh, the first time that I found out about that restaurant was through you. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. hundred percent. hundred percent. And then I, and then I, <laughs> I remember uh, I found it on your page and I saw your post. And then I was walking around that uh, part of the BX, which is basically, um, what's it called? I'm forgetting, uh, Parkchester. Okay. And I was like, oh. Okay, I, I know this. Like, I've walked by it, never really paying attention to it. And then, because of what you put up, I realized there was a history and there was a story yes. to it. It's and it so does. It, it's a beautiful looking spot. It's, it's very small on the outside. Um, it's also pretty small on the inside, yes. too. But it's, like you said, the um, interior is vibrant, it's lively, it's beautiful. The food looked amazing. Um, and that was the first time that I, that I realized I've passed by this place so many times not paying attention to it. But I think it's also because, you know, representation is so important, of course, to us, you know, people of color, Latinos, that, you know, I don't know, I just feel like sometimes you don't pay attention to some of those spots because you don't have it blasted over and over again on social media. Or they don't have the money for advertising. Or they don't have the money for, for you know, marketing and, and uh, you know, and I'm guilty of, you know, having ignored so many spots that, that you know, regrettably, I go to them and I'm like, wow, I should have been at this spot then maybe supporting all these sort of bl bland restaurants in the city that really aren't connecting with me on an emotional mm -hmm. level, you know, mm -hmm. which I feel like the more I'm in this whole food world, you know, having an emotional connection is super important to me when it yeah, comes to food. Yeah, I think, I think that's why we connected. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. yeah, it, it's, it's, it's one thing to go eat and okay, you're, you're good, you're satisfied, but then you walk away and you're like, well, what did I get out of that? Mm -hmm. You know, especially if it comes mm -hmm. to food that, you know, we grew up with. Mm -hmm. I don't want to go to a Dominican spot and just have Dominican food and not feel like there's something there. Right, like I, like you my know? grandmother made it. Like, right. what is what, this makes me feel good. Right. I think of Enver and his family. Enver's the owner, like, with such a sweet memory. And, I'm, mm -hmm. and I, I, I tell everybody, you need to go. You must yeah. go. You're going to love it. Yeah. So have you gone? I haven't I haven't gone yet, but um, so I actually... we need to go. We should go. Well, that's the thing. I actually wanted to ask you. Let's go together because I feel like when it comes I love to it. yeah, when it comes to certain restaurants, if I if I do see it on somebody else's page and I know them and I kind of connect with them, it's like take me there, show me your yeah. experience, let me have it. You know, let's let's give credit where credit is due. I don't want to walk in there and be like, look at the spot that I found. It's yeah. like no, it's like Nadia it's told me about experience. it. Yeah, and it, it, it seems fun. Um, I, I, I want to pivot a little bit to another thing that uh, I found out when I was reading your, your, your bio. Uh, it said that you did, and we'll go back to food, but this is really like, interesting to me. You did improv? I did improv. Okay, that's amazing, because yeah. I did improv as well, and I have never met anyone else except my girlfriend who's on improv. Really? So tell me about your experience, because you went to UCB. I have such a sweet story. Tell me, please, because I, I, love, I, love, I love anything about improv, so tell me about it. I mean, how I got there to me is more okay. 
Yes, yeah, so, so tell me that. Julie, you were following me. Have you been following me for a while? I had started following you before we met, so it was, I'd say, March of okay, this year. Okay, so I took improv, like, in October. To make okay. a very long story short, I have a small following. Mm -hmm. I mean, well, 4,000 is... is I don't. I mean, that's that's still thousands. Yeah, right? you're, you're, but the it, word, but the it's, word it's thousands is there. It's small, but they're so loyal. And so I had gotten robbed. They took my my purse. I had to mm -hmm. buy a, get a locksmith to get a new key. My car was in the path, and I went on Instagram. Just I sat down in the path and mm -hmm. I cried mm -hmm. because I was like, I can't believe how just horrible this week has been. Yeah. And I wanted to take this improv class, and I'm gonna have to take this money to pay for this locksmith. And so I put it on Instagram, and to make a very long story short, my Instagrammers, like three people, they Venmo, they, they found my cash app, wow. and they were like, we want you to take that improv class. And I go to this improv class, which I was really nervous about. This is great for me, but in front of people, I'm like, I'm just yeah. starting to MC. Yeah. It kind of freaks me out. <laughs> um, but it was a great experience, and I want to go back for two because now there's so many things that I do. Right because of improv. And yes. I, I think that everybody, regardless of what field you're taking, you should take. But for me, it was a blessed class. So you took you took 101? I took 101. And you didn't go back for 201 no, yet? No, no. Um, I agree with you on the improv thing. So I took it because I wanted to challenge myself. I wanted to really push myself out there. I mean, I've always loved comedy. Comedy is, you know, it's always been a part of my life. And I just recently saw a live taping of Saturday Night Live. So, like, I love So you that took it for, com for comedy. I took it not necessarily for comedy. I took it for a challenge. The okay. same way that I sort of started doing this show with no background on TV. I was like, I want to challenge myself and do something. But you took improv, so it helps. It helps exponentially. Yes. To do anything from going up to a stranger to having more confidence in front of other people. Uh, you you do ad living ad living it right helps you know a lot. It, it, it gets yeah. your wits going um, yeah it uh, it does help with socializing in general and not I, I I didn't have a problem socializing I just felt like you know sometimes you just feel uncomfortable in your skin sometimes and you kind of want to break away from it so I was like all right let me just jump into something like improv Wait, but you did your did you go on my LinkedIn no no I uh, I took it from other means your information oh, <laughs> but, okay. but yeah but when I when I <laughs> When I saw that, I was like, that's really interesting because, again, I haven't met too many people, especially Latinos, who done improv, right? So it's like, and I'm, and I'm still friendly with some of my, you know, uh, former classmates. Yeah, I, but my classmates weren't Latino. No, I had no one that was my shade of, you know, brown. It was, it was lighter. Oh, right. But at the right. same time, I was like, this is, I hope that more people of color get into this, you know? And, and I felt that uh, with, with uh, improv and then doing social media, it's sort of, pushed me out of my own comfort yeah. zone. Kind of like when you're saying, you know, you, you're DJing now and it's sort of like still... Well, I'm seeing. I'm oh, I'm sorry. I'm seeing. Yeah. Um, it's something that, you know, I feel like it's so important to push yourself out there. Yes. You know, so I, I think that's actually very, very cool that you did, um, you did improv. Um, so tell me your favorite spot uh, that you love to go to, whether it's in the Bronx, whether it's in any other borough, your number one spot, the one that you can put on blast and tell me that everyone else should go to. So I thought about this and I thought about it hard, but I think right now, and it's not to say that this is always the place or the place that I'm always going to have, yeah. but Lady Bird, Lower okay. East Side, is mm -hmm. one of my favorite places because I'm not vegan, but I'm lactose intolerant, and there's nothing that I can look on that menu that I'm not going to be able to eat, right? right. It's beautiful. Mm -hmm. Everybody wants an Instagram-friendly <laughs> restaurant. Lady Bird is it. That is the spot, The yeah. service was amazing. Yeah. When I went, you know, the two times that I went, my server and the bartender just gave me all of these different um, things to try. They were so great at pairing my food with awesome. the, the, the wine. And I don't know. I, I love Lady Bird. So Lady Bird. Okay, Lady Bird. So that's, that's your spot. Yes. I agree. It's like, you know, uh, a menu like that is just you can't go wrong with it, right? So, all right, Lady Bird it is. All right, guys, stay connected with Nadia Cruz on Instagram at Featured Sauce. We're taking a quick break. Fruity Down Bronx. We'll be right back. In four days. There was an old woman who lived in a shoe. She had so many children, she didn't know what to do. Did you have a good day at school? She gave them some broth. Without any bread. There you go. And 
kiss them all soundly. Night night. Good night. And put them to bed. Hunger is a story we can end. End it at feedingamerica.org. Cheru has no choice. She and millions like her walk miles a day for dirty water. But together, we can end their walk by providing clean water close by. Instead of spending hours walking to get water that makes them sick, girls can be in a classroom and moms will gain back time to care for their families. Sons and daughters can grow up strong, finally free of sicknesses. It's true. When you just add water, you change a life. Learn more at worldvision.org. So, I'm kind of new here, but I've noticed a trend. My human does this funny thing where she goes around and gets all my toys, and then she hides them in that basket by the door. You know, but it's always the same basket, and it's always in the, in the same place. And then she acts so surprised when I find them, but, you know, she's putting them in the same basket. Again. It's like, hello? That's where you put it last time. You were the worst at hide-and-go-seek. Behold the angry giant. Behold the angry giant. Behold the angry giant. Behold the angry giant. It only takes a moment to make a moment. Take time to be a dad today. For all the papas out there, let's stop what we're doing and take a moment. A moment to be with our kids. They can be loud moments, goofy moments, sporty moments, dorky moments, kooky moments. Moments where we talk or walk or just hang out. It doesn't really matter. They all count because every time dads take a moment to be with their kids, well, it's pretty momentous. So let's all take a moment to make a moment today. Leaving hot coals improperly extinguished can cause a wildfire. Hey guys, it's smoking! It looks as if smoking is going to use the drown, stir, drown, and feel technique. After the first drown, a good start. Next, another drink. And finally, a close feel. Is it cool? cool. Okay. Yeah. Hey, Smokey, catch! Oh, my bad, Smokey. Only you can prevent wildfires. neighbors and best friends. <laughs> I love my sister. My heart, my heart doesn't, doesn't see race. race. Love, love is love. Our family is no less than any other family. Back to Foodie Down Bronx. I'm your host, M, the Hungry Dominican. Our next guest is a local NYC blogger who originally hails from Germany but has made her home here in the Bronx for nearly 30 years. You can find her on Instagram under Gotham Foodie. Please welcome the very cool sounding Erica Rage. Wow. Are you part of the X Men or something? That's a very cool name. What's going on with I that? I would like to be. Um, so, you actually told me that your name is not pronounced Rage. So, it's spelled W R A G E. Yes. But it's pronounced how? Vrag. What's that? Vrag. Wow. It's uh, an old Viking thing. 
Old, wow. Yes. Chasira Bronx Viking, is that what you're saying? I am, That's actually. very cool. Uh, that's I'm my actually, ancestry, yeah. Uh, uh, so I'm interested in that because you, you, you come from Germany and you came to America about 27 years ago? Um, 28? 30. Oh, so it's, okay. 87. I came in okay. 87. Don't test um, me on math. So how does a, a German girl like you end up in the Bronx? How is that? Give me that whole... Destiny. <laughs> destiny, yes. yes. I think it's destiny. Yes. But how I've, did you find yourself here in the Bronx? I've always been attracted to it. Um, I, I was a big hip-hop fan before I was hip-hop. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, it came from the Bronx. So and there, I wanted to be there. So over there in Germany, you were listening to... Uh, Curtis Blow. Curtis Blow, <laughs> yeah. Beastie Boys. Yeah, Grandmaster right? Flash, all that. MDMC. And I know it was born here. And uh, wow. that was my... That's where I needed to be. That's really amazing because, like, that reminds me of, like, you know, you'll watch a movie and, like, there'll be a character who has, like, a picture of, like, New York in the background, right? And it'll be like, uh, my yes. dream is to go to New York. Oh, my God, yes. But you were specific. That's you said the Bronx. I got to yes. come to the Bronx. Harlem and Bronx. Harlem and that's Bronx. That's where I wanted to be, yes. That's, that's admirable. <laughs> yes. I have to say. Uh, yeah. That's very, very cool. Yeah. And so you got here in 87, and what was your experience when you finally got to the Bronx? How Did it, did it meet your expectations? Uh, were you were I you just, just thrilled to be here? I belong. You fit into it. Yes. Because you don't consider it's me. you don't consider yourself someone from Germany. You consider yourself a New Yorker. Is that one hundred percent New Yorker? Right. Yes. Right. I, so I was. Yeah. You uh, you came to the Bronx. You came to New York, and you did have some background in the food industry. You were a I bartended. A bartender. Yes. Okay. Yes. And I raised two kids on my own, so. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And and we had spoken briefly about. The fact that you have you have a love for old New York, yes. like pre Giuliani, pre yes. Disney type yes. era. Yes. Um, the, you know, for me, my only point of reference is like either a you know a movie yeah. or, or newspaper oh, yeah. clippings. But there was definitely a vibe going on there. Yes, I'll I lived, never yeah. know. I lived in Times Square before it was okay to even walk there. Oh wow! I was you know with questionable neighbors. <laughs> right, right. But, <laughs> Let's but put tell it me, that way. But tell me your experience about bartending in like old New York. How, what's the craziest thing you went through? What did it teach you? How did it form your relationship with the city? Tell me about that. It taught me patience, for mm -hmm. sure, right. because it can be trying testing. Mm -hmm. um, it was really just a way to make money and get to know people on all levels. Right. Because if you bartend in, in Times Square, which I have for over 30 years on and off, you really meet everybody from each walk of life, from each background, from other countries, mm -hmm. tourists, people homegrown. So it right. was like uh, I learned how to be more relatable through it right. And, right. and have patience for people who don't really get things sometimes. So, so it seems like it was like maybe like the perfect... Uh, starting point for you. A gateway, yeah. Coming into New Absolutely, York. Yeah. And like you said, you meet so many people from like different, you know, socioeconomic backgrounds yeah. and, you know, different colors and different mm -hmm. experiences because, you know, food and drinks, it's all communal. You all totally. sort of like, That's why I love it. you know, yes. you get together, you relate. Yes. Um, did that, was that the trigger for your love of food or was it something that you always loved? Well, I always like to cook, and mm. I always have cooked. I always have a huge Christmas dinner with all my friends that come to my house. I've done it for decades. Oh, God, decades. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, But um, when I quit smoking, I regained my sense of taste and smell, right. and that accelerated me to um, the okay. blogger thing. Okay. So yeah. how long were you a smoker for? Over 30 years. Well, that's a long time. Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, you know, actually, I've never actually asked somebody about that. So how does it? change your palate do you, i mean i mean it's it's um it's obvious that it would yeah right you, you it's do almost start, shocking right you do start tasting flavors yeah. that maybe you didn't know were present yeah. in your food yeah um but do you find that overall you just enjoy eating foods because of the fact that you're not smoking the way totally you yeah. yes yeah absolutely um because you know it just it completely changes everything yeah, it's, it's like a miracle <laughs> right right <laughs> i love it <laughs> um so you so you've always loved cooking you make mm -hmm. these big meals um yeah. and and your blog uh you show off a lot of your your home cooked meals it, yes and you mix it in with now i get it now it's like you do post a lot from harlem you post a lot from yes. harlem my and favorite restaurant is in harlem <laughs> right. yes mm -hmm. right and of course you post a lot from from the bronx yeah. um now I, I do know that you tend to be a little bit more finicky with certain foods that you go out to eat because you feel like you cook them better, right? Yes. Which is fine. You can own that. That's I, fine. I, I feel I cook some amazing pasta. What do you think that pasta? Okay, yes, so that's the thing that. Yes. So, do you have an Italian restaurant 
that is either equal to what you make, perhaps a little better, some you know, place that you would go out to eat and spend your, your, your money and your time at. Yeah, I mean, I don't want to say better. <laughs> But good enough to actually. I get love you Patricia's on Mars Park okay. Avenue. I okay. love it. Yeah. Yeah. Then I, I haven't. Uh, I haven't been there, but I've I passed it a few times. Have a times. little pasta with like little purse, mm -hmm. something with mushrooms and peas, and has cheese inside, and. Yeah. And it, is, is that a dish that you could replicate yourself, or is that something that no. you go to Patricia's? No, I will only most likely eat something I can't make. I see. So. I see. Okay. So. Um, Tell me more about your, your home cooking because, like I said, your Instagram, your social media is a mix of spots in the BX, Manhattan, but a lot of it comes from your own yes. experience. Now, you claim that you cook every single day. Do you cook every single day? Well, I, when I wrote that, I did. I okay. slowed down a little because blogging is taking much more of my mm -hmm. time than I thought it would. But I, I do cook, I'd say, a minimum of three times a week. Oh, yeah. Wow. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Absolutely, yeah. I get so fresh ingredients. Let's everything. talk about the blogging because um, you have a really good uh, page. You have a really active page. You have, you have great pictures. Oh, um, thank you. Social media, did, did it come naturally to you? Yes. Did You had your blog before Instagram? I had my Instagram first, but okay. I was just putting funny pictures, and I kind of revamped it after I started my blog. Right. And um, I just love taking pictures, and I like to challenge myself to be right. better. Right. So do you feel like um, do you feel like you create dishes that uh, that you know you're going to put on Instagram? So you're sort of pushing yourself a little more to either perfect the recipe, or or when it comes to taking pictures, you know, take the best picture you can. I always try to take the best picture I can, but my my main focus on posting home-cooked meals is to show people that it can be really easy mm -hmm. to make something really delicious mm -hmm. and it doesn't have to take uh, insane you know amounts of stuff that we don't know about like it doesn't have to be sea salt on three quarters of right. my life put it Put a teaspoon of salt. So you sort of, you yeah. cook, you cook uh, I mean, you do follow recipes, but of course, yes. it's super important I to follow them. I simplify it. But you tend to go sort of instinctually, like you, you, you cook, sort of like, yeah. like a lot of people in my family just sort of, you know, they, yes. whatever a dash Some of salt recipes, means to yes. them, they just, that's yes. their version of a but dash I of salt. But I do take also um, um, recipes from other chefs, celebrity mm. chefs or whoever I like, and right. I recook their recipes. I see. And sometimes if you read it in a cookbook or even on the internet, it just seems so confusing that mm. people give up. Right. And I try to take that recipe, simplify it, and put the, put the pictures there for you mm -hmm. to make it yourself. Right. So you can, you can make something that Marcus Samuelson cooked in his kitchen, and it's really not that hard. Right. That, so that's what I'm trying to portray. I, uh, so I, I started cooking more recently because um, I, I had mentioned to you that I want to start being more of an active eater as opposed to a passive yeah, eater. You know, I want to really yeah. know what, so what, what chefs, you know, the, the, the blood, sweat, and tears that they put into the, into the meal they're making me. So, and also because there's empathy, right? You want to empathize with these people. You want to know what they're yes, going through. And totally. you also don't want to just have like a blank stare when they throw like a word at you that you don't even, <laughs> yeah. you don't even know what it means. And you're Risk like, oh, well, thank you. Yeah, thank you, <laughs> chef. Um, but... One of the reasons that it took me a long, long time to start cooking consistently is because I would look at a recipe and I would be scared to death. Exactly. Right? Everything was just so specific. Yes. And it just, it, it would turn me off right away. Yes, and that's why like, that's my mission, to simplify it. So, so you, everybody right. can just go ahead and have a great volunteer. You want to show people that whatever you're making is as simple as Absolutely. just literally following the rules or, or yes. and not such, being such a German thing. Follow the instructions. <laughs> right. Very diligent. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, you mentioned that you, you do recreate a lot of um, uh, dishes from famous chefs. Yes. So tell me who you are a big fan of specifically. Wow. Specifically? We've covered Marcus, right? So Samuelson, yes. I'm assuming you, you Well, are I like a fan. all the, not all, I can't say all, but I'm a, I'm, I'm a follow of the, um, Top Chef, Bravo Top Chef, mm -hmm, chefs, mm -hmm. I seek them out. I buy their cookbooks and mm -hmm. stuff. They're just all accomplished before they even get on the show. Right. So if I'm in a different city or something, I, I'll Google and see if they're there. And mm -hmm. I've never been disappointed. Amazing. That makes, you, that makes you a super fan, doesn't it? That makes it you does so, not. <laughs> <laughs> that makes you someone it who's like... It makes me an admirer, of, an admirer of the craft. That's a super fan. That's someone who looks up and like, oh, so-and-so's okay, well, going to be... <laughs> okay, I'll take it. <laughs> um, so... Samuelson and uh, and he has of course uh, I believe it's Streetbird in. Uh, the Streetbird is closed now. He cool. has okay. uh, um, the Red Rooster on 125th Street. Red Rooster. Yeah, I, I went uh, for Restaurant Week there about 
I'm going to say three years ago. It was, yeah. it was a lovely experience. He changes the menu all the time, and everything is just really good there. Mm. And um, I think he has another one in New Jersey. Okay. So who else uh, are you a fan of? Who else? What other dishes do you uh, recreate? Everything. Mm. Honestly, there is no limit. Um, I give in the mood I, I, of something that I want to eat, and then I try and find a recipe. I like Amarola Agassi. Mm -hmm. I cook like hundreds of his recipes right, already. Right. I love him. Um, so, so yeah, you don't, you don't no necessarily limit. you don't necessarily limit yourself to one type of cuisine. No, you try, no, and, and, and you've said as much to me. You you know you've been here for so long. Yeah. So you do have that Latin influence. Yeah. When it comes to food oh. and 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 your yeah. palate, um, what's okay. your favorite Latin dish to to, to make? Probably pesto penim. Penim. That's yeah. an excellent answer. But That's the best answer you yeah. can give me. I love that. <laughs> yeah, that's the, the best. The, the crisscross crust on top, and right. nice and crispy. Yeah, I, I haven't, that. I haven't yeah. made that yet. I'm actually, that's, uh, that's the next thing I want to make. I want to make a bernin. So, it's so simple. Oh my it's, god. Yeah, it's, it's very so simple. simple. But again, it was one of those things where when I first saw the initial recipe, I was like, "There's no way I'm going to do this. I'm just going to order some chicharrón or something and just get it over with." It's you so know? good. But it's, it's a very simple, it's yeah. a very simple enough dish. It is. How are your rice and bean skills? Are they pretty good? Yeah. Yeah. I think Can you make so, some postrones? Yes. Can you rock some, some platanos? Mm, I've made them Jamaican style, not Spanish How so? Style. What's Jamaican style? I don't know. It's just seasoning and you fry it. I don't know really out of the top of my head. It's, just, it's sort of like you, you It's just probably the same. I just okay. haven't done okay. it the Spanish way. Okay. So I don't know if it's... I'm guessing it's the same. So, you know what? I'll ask you this. What do you prefer? Sweet plantains or the green ones? The green ones. The green ones? Yes. Good answer. I'm not much of a sweet person. No. So you don't have a sweet tooth? No. So I wouldn't find like a cake on your page. Absolutely not. No. No. Why not? You can buy them some so much better. Oh, okay. Fair enough. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I won't be looking on your page for like any no. like cheesecake no. recipes or anything. No. No. Okay. No. How about uh I can tell you where you can buy the best one though. Where? Um probably my favorite cheesecake is um from Juniors. From Juniors? Yes. Mm -hmm. So But I go to Brooklyn. You go to the Brooklyn yes. location mm -hmm. to get yes. it from. You, so yeah. you don't. You wouldn't buy it if you saw it at the supermarket. You would have to go to Brooklyn. To I get mean, it. if you really want one, real quick, yes. Right. But if, if you, were like, you know, I would go to Brooklyn. Yeah. How often do you do you travel outside of the Bronx and Harlem to to uh, enjoy restaurants? At least once a week. Really. Probably so what's the, more what's like the, two, three times. What's a week. the last restaurant you went to that wasn't Harlem or Bronx based? Oh, in Philadelphia. In Philly. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. where, I went to Royal Boucherie by okay. Nicholas Elmy, Top Chef. Mm -hmm. Top Chef. <laughs> yeah. Once again, making you a super fan. <laughs> <laughs> You're a total super fan. Yes, yes. Um, okay, so let's get back to, let's stick with like the whole plantain theme. Yes. Do you like mofongo or mangu? What do you prefer? I'm not going to tell you that I know you have the difference. To. You have to. Because I feel, you don't know, you don't feel like you know it enough to. No, I don't think you have cooked Dominican food that way. You've never cooked Dominican no. food? Is that what you're saying? I'm going to now. I mean, I would hope so. <laughs> yes, I'll, I'll, I'll cook some and I'll bring you some. I feel like... And uh, you can be the judge. That's fine. I'll, yes. I'll happily be the judge. I feel like that, that to me is a make or break question when I ask yeah. people, I'm like, oh, mofongo yeah. mangu, and then that defines the I've future of our relationship. Do you like <gasps> mofongo? Yes. Yeah? yeah? Do you like mangu? I don't know. I, think, I don't think I've ever had that. I'm, so, I'm going to be stuck on that for the whole day. Oh, that's You've not never nice. Had mangu. <laughs> I'm going to have to ask your daughter to please give you mango as soon yes. as possible. Well, yes. Because things have to change here so okay. that we may continue um, our friendship. Let's do it. I'm down. <laughs> Tell me where to go. Excellent. Send me a recipe. I'm down. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> Fantastic. Stay connected with Erica on Instagram at Gotham Foodie and check out her blog at GothamFoodie.com. Well, that's all for the show, folks. Thank you again for tuning in and thank you to my guests for joining me today. Tune in every Thursday at 6.30 p.m. here on Bronxnet Optimum 67 and Files 33. Also, tune in on the go at bronxnet.org and find us on YouTube. From Bronxnet to the world, this is Foodie Down Bronx. I'm your host and the Hungry Dominican. Remember to feed your mind, feed your body, and if you see me coming along, Erica, feed me. Adios. <laughs> Bye,
We've been established here about 13 years. Uh, we do uh, Italian and seafood dishes. A lot of the recipes we got from uh, Italy where my grandparents came from. Everything's made fresh. All our soups are made fresh. Nothing's from the can. We keep the decorations very simple because the seafood rests around the water. It's like nautical, but we try to keep it like casual. But when people come here and they bring visitors, they like the feel. They said they feel like they're in Florida. It's not a fancy restaurant. We have outdoor dining with the deck. And at night, we have a beautiful view of the bridge, which is lit up. And all the boats come in and out in the summer. What's your favorite part of the restaurant? It's eating. <laughs> Here we have a couple dishes. We have linguine with clam sauce, penny vodka, uh, shrimp fried diablo, and we have the pork chop florentine, which has fresh mozzarella, uh, sauteed spinach, uh, and fresh marinara sauce, we call it. Other special that's really good is our lobster biscuit soup, which is made re uh, really good with big chunks of lobster meat in it. It's not pureed or anything. That's one of everybody's favorite. We like to uh, be involved in a lot of things that are going on in the neighborhood. Anybody that needs help, we're always there to help. We give out gift certificates, donate food. Like Salesian High School is doing some kind of international food night. They're picking up a dish from us. So we try to be very involved in the neighborhood. If you'd like to come to the Ice House Cafe, it's an Italian seafood restaurant. It's 3124 Hardin Avenue, located on the water inside of Hammonds Cove Marina. You can try a lot of different dishes that you won't find in any Italian restaurant. Everybody here is very friendly. A lot of people don't know where we are, you know, except for the local people in the neighborhood. I like to you know, make other people aware that there's nice areas in the Bronx to enjoy.